Hello everyone, my name is uh, Mazi Mokram and in this uh, video we are going to revise principles of managerial finance. Uh, first we are going to revise each chapter and then uh, solve uh, questions about uh, each one of them. The first chapter, uh, all, uh, we all know that the first chapter has uh, five main points. Uh, the first one is the defining of finance and managerial finance function, which means that finance is the science and the art of managing money, while managerial finance is considered with the duties of the financial manager working in a, in a business or inside uh, a firm. The second, uh, the second objective or the second goal of the chapter is describing the legal form of any firm or any business organization. We all know that we have uh, four uh, legal forms with, uh, which are sole proprietorship, uh, partnership, limited partnership, and the corporation. Okay. Uh, next, uh, the next goal of this chapter is to describe the goal of the firm and explain why maximizing the value of the firm is an appropriate goal for a business. As we know that the goal of the firm is to maximize its value and to maximize the wealth of its shareholder. So maximizing the value of the firm means that running the business in the interest of those who own it, which are the, the, the shareholders. Okay. The next goal is to identify the primary activities of the financial manager. Uh, which include, in addition to the ongoing involvement in the financial analysis and the planning of the firm, are making investment decisions and making financing decisions, which are the most important decisions the financial manager should make. The last uh, goal uh, of this chapter is to describe the nature of the principal agent relationship between the owners and the manager of the corporation and uh, explaining how. Uh, various corporate governance mechanisms attempt to manage agency problems. Now let's start uh, with solving questions on, uh, questions on chapter 1. Uh, which of the following is concerned with design and delivery of advice and financial products to individuals, businesses and governments, material finance, auditing services, financial services or uh, cost accounting? The answer, of course, will be C. Uh, because managerial finance is only uh, only focuses on uh, the uh, finance, internal finance of the companies, neither the business or the government, and all things services and cost accounting are not related to the finance. Second question: Managerial finance involves tasks such as budgeting, financial forecasting cash management and fund procurement or involves the design and delivery of advice and financial products or recognizes funds on an accrual basis or devotes most of its attention to the collection and presentation of financial data. Uh, the answer I think will be A because uh, these are the tasks of a financial manager such as, such as budgeting, financial forecasting, cash management, and funds procure, uh, procurements. All of these tasks are related to the managerial finance. Uh, neither the advice on financial products nor the uh, collection and presentation of the financial data are considered as, uh, as tasks of uh, managerial finance. Next question. Finance is... Uh, I think this is a um, straightforward one. Finance is the art and science of managing money, as mentioned before. So the answer will be uh, C. Next question. Which of the following is an area of career opportunities in financial services? Supply chain management, personal financial planning, auditing of financial statement, uh, or production planning. Uh, the answer here will be uh, B, because uh, financial services uh, are considered uh, as 
uh, the advising and uh, design of uh, different uh, financial product for the customers. Uh, and these tasks are the job description of personal financial planning. Next, next question. Uh, which of the following uh, is an area of career opportunities in managerial finance? Investment, real estate and insurance, capital expenditure, uh, management, personal financial planning. Uh, the answer here will be C. Because uh, capital expenditures man uh, management uh, is one of the tasks of uh, managerial finance. Uh, which of the following is a duty of financial manager in a business firm? A. Developing marketing plan. Of course not. This is a part of the marketing department. Uh, B. Controlling the stock price. No one in the world can control a stock price. This will be fraud, of course. Uh, so this is not the answer. Uh, C. Raising, uh, raising uh, financial resources. Uh, this is true. Uh, this is one of the tasks of a managerial a financial manager. Uh, and D. Auditing financial records. Mm, no, this is not the, an the answer uh, because it, uh, this is belongs to the uh, auditing department. So the answer here will be C. Which of the following is responsible for evaluating and recommending proposed uh, long-term investments? Financial analyst, credit manager, pension fund manager, capital expenditure manager. Uh, financial analysts uh, only uh, do uh, financial analysis for the firm, uh, like uh, uh, cost and benefit analysis and so on. Uh, credit manager, this is uh, in the banks, it's not in any firm. Uh, pension fund manager also, it's not uh, about long-term investments. So the answer will be uh, D. Which of the following legal forms of an organization is most expensive to organize? Sole proprietorships, partnerships, corporations, uh, or limited partnership? The answer will be C because uh, corporations are the biggest uh, legal form of an organization ever uh, happened uh, and it requires many uh, legalities and authorizations uh, to come to the light. Next question. Which of the following legal forms uh, of organization has the, has the ease of dissolution? So partnerships, Partnership, limited partnership, uh, or corporations. Uh, of course, this will be a sole proprietorships uh, because uh, it's uh, it has only uh, one manager and one partner, so uh, it will be easy to dissolve it. Um, next question: Under which of the following legal forms of organization is ownership readily? transferable sole proprietorships partnerships uh, limited partnerships or corporations the answer here will be corporations because uh, corporations uh, already are tradable in uh, the stock market so it's very easy uh, to uh, acquire a stock in any uh, corporation that is tradable on the stock market and then you became um, a partner in it so the answer will be D. Which of the following forms of organizations is, uh, is the easiest to form? Uh, the answer here would be, of course, A, sole proprietorships, uh, because it, is, it had the minimal uh, amount of legalities and authorizations uh, in order to uh, uh, form it. Okay, next question. Which of the following is a strength of a corporation? Low taxes, limited liability, uh, low organization costs, or less government regulation? The answer here will be uh, limited liability, B, because uh, the corporation itself it's con uh, is considered as a separate entity from the uh, owners of the corporation, which means that uh, 
the corporation or sorry the shareholders are not liable for the debt uh, the corporation has okay which of the following legal forms of organizations is characterized with uh, by a limited liability uh, sole proprietorship limited partnership corporation or c corporation uh, of course as we as we uh, as we said, said before uh, unlimited liability is a character uh, characteristic of sole proprietorship so the answer will be a next uh, next question which of the following is true of a partnership and a corporation in a corporation income is taxed at the corporate level whereas in a partnership income is taxed uh, twice uh, that's, this is not the answer of course uh, because uh, in a partnership uh, the, the income is taxed only on the corporate level while in the corporation the income is taxed uh, twice uh, the first time in the corporate at the corporate level and the second time at the shareholder uh, level so he is not the answer in a partnership income is taxed at at the corporate level with in a corporation income is taxed twice uh, I think this is the right answer as we uh, said uh, in a moment so the answer will be B Okay. Uh, which of the following is true of sole proprietorship and corporation? It is difficult to transfer ownership of corporations compared to the sole proprietorship. Oh, this is wrong because the easiest form uh, in which we can um, uh, transfer ownership it is the corporation. Uh, so A is not the answer. Income from both forms of organization are taxed only at the corporate level on uh, also this is not uh, the answer because in corporation uh, taxes are uh, income are taxed uh, twice uh, both sole proprietorships and corporations are equally uh, securitized and uh, regulated by the government uh, body uh, no this is not true uh, the final one in sole proprietorship owners have unlimited liability whereas uh, in corporation owners have limited liability that's true as we mentioned before so the answer will be D the primary goal of a financial manager is maxim uh, minimizing risk maximizing uh, profit minimi uh, maximizing wealth or minimizing return uh, as we said before uh, the primary goal of financial manager and the uh, whole board of directors is to maximize wealth. Uh, so the answer will be uh, C. Corporate owners receive return by realizing gains through increasing increases in share price and interest earnings. Uh, this is wrong. Uh, corporate owners do not receive uh, do not receive uh, interest earnings. Uh, B realizing gains through increase in share price and cash dividends uh, this is true uh, the main source of return uh, for any owner in a corporation uh, is through two things the first one is uh, increasing the share price and the second one is the, uh, is the cash dividend so the answer will be uh, B Which of the following is the best uh, measure of profit maximization goal? Returned earnings, uh, risk of the investment, earning per share, timing of the return. The answer here will be the earning per share because uh, using uh, earning per share uh, we can measure uh, the growth in the uh, profit over the time. Okay. Uh, next question profit maximization as the goal of the firm uh, is not ideal because profits are only accounting measures uh, that's not true uh, cash flows 
are more representative uh, of uh, financial strength mm, no they are not uh, profit maximization does not consider risk maybe that's true profits today are less desirable than profits earned in the future years mm, no of course this is not true also so the answer here will be uh, C uh, because profit maximization concept uh, in the firms does not consider uh, the part of the risk uh, because as we all know uh, there is no return or profit without a risk so uh, the company should also con consider this because it's a very important thing uh, to bear uh, the acceptable level of the risk in any investment the firm uh, is, go is going to it in it <clears throat> next question cash flows and uh, risk are the key determinants in share price increased cash flow results in a lower share price a higher share price an unchanged uh, share price or an undetermined share price. Of course, uh, uh, other things remaining the same uh, whenever the cash flows increase, which means the companies have uh, has more cash, uh, and this means more profits. Uh, so this will result to the in a higher uh, share price. So the answer will be B. Cash flows and risk are the key determinants in share price. Increased risk, other thing, things remaining the same, results in a lower share price, a higher share price, an unchanged uh, share price, and undetermined uh, share price. Uh, I think the answer here will be A, a lower share price, because uh, the risk here, uh, the cash flows or the risk here, the company, uh, the, least, uh, the, uh, the more likely the shareholders will be uh, willing to sell this uh, this share or this uh, stock so this will lower the price okay a financial manager must choose between three alternatives or, or three alternative investments each asset is expected to provide earnings over a three year period as described in this table below based on wealth uh, on the wealth maximization goal the financial manager would choose asset one or asset two or asset three will be indifferent between the three uh, the two assets the first two assets in order to choose between uh, three different assets with uh, three different cash flows, we must choose uh, the one that have that has the earliest uh, cash flows, which means it it will be uh, asset one because it has twenty one thousand dollars in year one and seventeen thousand dollars in year two, which means uh, it have it has the earliest cash flows between uh, the other. Uh, assets. So the answer will be A. So uh, the rule of thumb uh, in any financial project or in any project, uh, the sooner you get your uh, cash flows uh, over the uh, life of the project, the better. So you always uh, look for the asset or the project that uh, that gives you gives you uh, your cash sooner than the others okay which of the following activities of a finance manager determines how the firm raises money to pay for the assets in which it invests financial analysis and planning investment decisions financing decisions analyzing and planning cash flows okay as long as we are talking about raising money, so this will be a financing decision. How I can get uh, money to pay for the assets. This is considered as a financing decision. So the, uh, the answer will be C. 
the financial managers uh, investment decision determine both the mix and the type of assets found in the, or the firm's balance sheet both, uh, both the mix and the type of liabilities uh, found on the firm's balance sheet both the mix and type of assets and liabilities found on the uh, balance sheet both the mix of uh, and the type of short-term and long-term financing I think the answer will be uh, A uh, because investment decisions are uh, only consider the assets or the type of assets found in the firm's uh, balance sheet the liabilities uh, in the balance sheet are considered as investment uh, sorry uh, financing decisions not investment decisions so the assets only are uh, considered as investment decisions next question a financial manager's financial or financing decisions determine both the mix and the type of assets found on the firm's balance sheet no this is not the answer or the types of assets are determined by the investment decisions uh, be most the most appropriate mix of short-term and long-term financing this is true uh, because the mix between uh, a type of financing is considered uh, uh, from uh, financing decisions so the answer here will be uh, B which of the following is an example of agency cost cost incurred from uh, for setting up the agency no this is not the answer failure of making the best investment decision that's true payment of income tax payment of interest no no uh, so the answer here will be b because uh, when the board of directors uh, does not make uh, the best investment decision uh, this create an agency cost or a problem with the shareholders so the answer will be b <clears throat> which of the following is the best measure to ensure that the management decisions are the best interest are in the best interest of the stockholders fire managers who are not efficient or inefficient no uh, remove management's prerequisites of course not time management compensation to the performance of the company's common stock that's true time management compensation to the level of dividend per share the dividend is irrelevant here so the answer will be C so when you apply the management compensation with the performance of the company stock this will enforce them this will force them to uh, make the best decision to maximize the value and the company's share price next question which of the following is one of the solution to the agency problems in publicly held corporation stock option stock split demotion of employees designations distribution of dividends uh, the thing the answer will be a stock options are uh, are considered as a type of compensation for the uh, board of directors uh, it's a compensation in form of uh, giving them stocks uh, instead of uh, giving them cash or uh, or other things so the uh, uh, answer here will be a incentive plans usually tie management compensation to share price dividends coupon payments and turn inventory turnover of course it will be a the answer is share price the conflict between the goals of a firm's owners and the goal of the non-owner manager is the agency problem as we said before so the answer will be a so this is the end of questions uh, on chapter one and next will be uh, questions on chapter two uh, let, uh, let's first review uh, the learning objectives or the learning goals uh, for chapter two the first one is understanding the role that financial institutions play in managerial finance as the financial institutions bring net suppliers of funds and net demanders of funds 
uh, together to help translate the savings of individuals, businesses, and government into loans and other types of investments. The second one uh, is knowing the functions of the financial institutions and the financial markets. As we know, the financial institutions collect the savings of individuals and channel them to the borrowers, such as businesses and governments, which means that the business and, uh, and government are considered as uh, net demanders of uh, uh, funds, while the individuals are considered as net suppliers of the funds. Uh, then the financial markets provide a form in which the savers and borrowers can transact businesses directly. Uh, the last uh, objective is to describe the differences between the capital markets and the money markets. As we know that uh, in the money markets, savers who want a temporary place to deposit uh, their funds uh, where they can earn interest interact with borrowers who have a short-term need for funds. This short term usually uh, less than one year. In contrast, the capital market is a form in which savers and borrowers interact on a long term basis, usually uh, more than one year. So let's move on to the questions. Uh, question one. As a key participant in financial transactions, individuals are considered as net demanders of funds because they uh, save more money than they borrow. That's wrong, they are not net demanders. Net users of funds because they save less money than they borrow. No, that's not true. C, uh, net suppliers of the fund because they save more money than they borrow. That's one true, so the answer is C. Government is typically a net provider of funds because uh, because it borrows more than it saves, that's wrong. Net demanders, uh, net, sorry, net uh, demander of funds because it borrows more uh, than it saves, that sound true. Uh, net provider of funds because it can print money at will, no, that's wrong. Net demander of funds because it saves more money uh, than it borrows, also this statement is wrong, so the answer will be uh, B. Next question. Government can obtain fund by trading in equity markets. No, only uh, uh, only the businesses and individuals can trade in the equity market. Uh, B by issuing financial instruments such as futures and options. No, or, no, of course not. Uh, futures and options are offered uh, or issued by uh, companies. C through forex market. No, that's not true. Forex market is a whole different thing. And D by selling that securities. That one is true. Uh, government can issue uh, short term debts like T bills or uh, trigger bills, uh, or they can issue long term uh, debt securities like uh, 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 notes payable and so on. So the answer will be uh, D. The next question, firms that require funds from external sources can obtain them through uh, financial institutions from central, bl central bank directly through forex market by issuing T-bills. Of course, uh, uh, no one can uh, deal with the central bank directly. Uh, also, the forex market uh, is not a source uh, of funds and the uh, issuing two bills uh, issuing T-bills, the, the central bank it is the only uh, one that can issue T-bills and the firms cannot do that, so the answer will be A. Investment banks are institutions that perform all activities of commercial banks and retail banks. Of course not. Investment banks are different entities than commercial bank and retail banks. So this is not the true one. Uh, investment banks are institutions that are exempt from securities and exchange commission regulations. No, that's not true. Engage in trading and market making activities. That's true. Are only limited to capital market activities. That's not true. So the answer will be 
C. Which of the following serves as an intermediary channeling? Uh, as an intermediary channeling the savings of individual businesses and governments into loans and investments, financial institutions, financial uh, market, securities and uh, exchange commission, the OTC market. Uh, as we uh, said before, the intermediary are the financial institutions. So the answer is A. Which of the following assists companies in raising capital, advise firms on major transactions such as merger and acquisitions or financial restructuring and engage in trading and market making activities, Invent investment banks, securities exchanges, mutual funds, commercial banks. So as we know, as we know, the one of the, the institutions that are uh, engaged in trading engaging in trading and market making uh, activities and as well as advise the firms on major transactions or the investment banks so the answer will be a most businesses raise money by selling their securities in a public offering forex market future market com commodities market the answer here will be a because when businesses uh, want to raise money by selling their securities for the first time to the public, uh, this operation called public offering. So this is the answer. Okay, next question. Which of the following is a mean of selling bonds or stocks to the public? Private placement, public offering, organized selling, direct placement. As we explained before, uh, when the, whenever the company uh, sells bonds or stocks for the first time for the public, uh, this is called a public offering. <clears throat> uh, this uh, operation called public offering. So the answer will be B. Next question. The sale of a new security directly to an investor or a group of investors called arbitraging, short selling, a capital market transaction, a private placement. Okay, whenever you sell a security as a company directly to a specific investor or a group of investors, uh, this operation called a private placement, which, which is the opposite of the public offering. So the answer here will be D. Okay. <clears throat> which market is where the securities are initially issued? And, and which market is where pre-owned securities or not new issues are traded. Uh, as we uh, mentioned before, uh, the securities that are initially issued are traded or are sold in the primary market and the pre-owned securities are traded in the secondary market. So the answer would be A. The over-the-counter over or OTC market is a highly liquid market as compared to the NASDAQ. This is not true. A market in which low-risk, high-return securities are traded. This is also not true. An organized market in which all financial derivatives are traded. Uh, it's not an organized market, so this is not true. A market where smaller unlisted securities are traded. That's the right answer. So because the OTC or over-the-counter <clears throat> is a small market in which uh, unlisted uh, firms that are uh, that does not uh, fulfill the obligation or the requirements to be listed in the uh, NASDAQ or the S&P 500 are uh, listed in the OTC or traded in the OTC. So the answer is D. Which of the following is true about primary market. It is an organized market in which all the financial derivatives are traded. That's not true. It is regulated by the Serpents Oxley Act. No. Uh, it is a market where smaller unlisted securities are traded. No, that's true. That's not true, of course, because uh, it is the OTC market. And the, it is the only market 
in which the issuer is directly involved in the transaction. Uh, this statement is true because, as we, uh, as we said before, uh, the primary market is the market in which the issuer or the firm uh, is directly involved in the selling transaction. So the answer here is D. Next question. Which of the following is true uh, about of a secondary market. <clears throat> it is a market for an unlisted company to raise equity capital. No, that's not true. It is a market where the securities are issued through private placements. No, this is a primary market. Uh, it is a market in which the short-term money market instruments such as T-bills or treasury bills are traded. No, that's not true. And the final one, it is a market in which pre-owned securities are traded. This statement is true, so the answer is B. The key securities traded in the capital market are commercial paper and T-bills. No, these are not traded in the capital market, so these are uh, money market instruments. Uh, B, T-bills and certificate of deposits. No, that's not true either. Go, these are money market instruments, uh, stocks and bonds, that's true. And finally, uh, bills of exchange and commercial paper, no, also they are uh, money market instruments. So the answer here is C. Which of the following is true of a dealer market? Buyer, buyers and sellers are never brought together directly. I think that's a uh, right one. Brokers execute the buy or sell orders in a dealer market. No, brokers are executing these orders in the broker market, not the dealer market. It has a centralized trading floors. No, this is a broker market. Uh, it is a part of the broker market. No, it's a separate market. So the answer here is A. Buyers and sellers <coughs> are never bought together directly. Okay. Which of the following is created by a financial uh, relationship between suppliers and, demand, uh, and demanders of short-term funds? Stock market, capital market, forex market, money market. So because we are speaking about short-term funds, so the answer here will be money market because the instruments traded in the money market are the short-term instruments, which are less than one year. So the answer, answer here is D. By definition, <clears throat> the money market involves the buying and selling of stocks and bonds. No, that's not true. Short-term securities, all financial and instruments expect, except derivatives, secured premium notes. Of course, uh, because we are speaking about the money market, so the answer will be B, short-term securities. Which of the following is an example of marketable securities? Treasury bills, treasury stocks, mortgage-backed securities, loans. So the answer here will be treasury bills because these bills are the only one that are short-term in the nature. Uh, because it's less than uh, its maturity less than one year. The other options are all uh, long-term instruments. So the answer would be A. In which market the buyer and the seller are brought together to trade securities in an organization called which of the following? Dealer and securities market, broker and over-the-counter market, uh, broker and securities market, dealer and over-the-counter market. I think the answer here would be C, broker and securities market, because in the broker market, the buyer and seller can be brought together to trade uh, securities <clears throat> in an organization called securities market, such as the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, and any uh, platform they can trade securities on. So the answer here would be C. Okay, next question. In which market the buyer and the sellers are not brought together to trade securities directly, but instead they have 
uh, instead have their orders executed on a on the which of the following dealer market and securities market broker and over the counter market broker and securities market or uh, dealer and over the counter market I think the answer here will be uh, D because in the dealers market uh, the buyer and the seller cannot be brought together and their uh, orders uh, can be executed only in the over the counter market because uh, because this market is considered as a dealer market so next question an efficient market is one where prices of stocks move up and down widely without apparent reason reason mm, that's not true this is not an efficient market of course uh, prices of stocks remain low for a long periods of time of course this is not true there is no stock market uh, remains in the same level for a long time uh, prices of stocks are unaffected by market news this is totally wrong always stock market is affected by the market news any news in the market can affect the stock prices uh, and finally the price of a security is an unbiased estimate of its true value that's the true one so the answer will be D because uh, the price of any security should uh, mirror or estimate uh, its true value next question the money market is a market in which or uh, that enables the supplier and demander of long-term funds to make transactions that's not true because money markets are short-term market uh, short-term uh, instruments only contain short-term instruments uh, which bring together supplies and demand of short-term funds that's what's true so the answer will be B okay uh, Apex Inc issues a bond of one thousand dollar which pays interest semi-annually at a coupon interest rate of eight percent the maturity of the bond is 15 years. Where should this bond be traded? Forex market, money market, capital market, commodities market. Of course, uh, uh, the bond is 15 years. Its maturity is 15 years. So it's considered as a long-term uh, source of fund. So it should be uh, traded in the capital market. So the answer will be C. Which of the following is true about preferred stocks? It has the features of bonds and a common stock. That's true. It has a claim on assets superior to the creditors in the uh, event of liquidations. That's not true. Creditors have the first, has, uh, have the first uh, uh, claim on assets. Uh, its dividends can be paid only after paying dividends to the common stockholders. No, that's not true. They receive their dividends first. Uh, finally, it usually has a maturity of 30 years. That's not true. Preferred stock does not uh, do not have any maturity at all. They are uh, what we call perpetuity for perpetuity. They are as long as the company lives. Uh, so the answer here will be A. Which of the following is a form in which suppliers and demanders funds can transact business directly? Shadow banking system? No, that's not true. Financial markets, commercial markets, financial institutions. Okay, uh, the form in which the, the suppliers and demanders can meet is the financial market. So the answer would be B. So uh, this is the end of chapter 2 and here we will start revising chapter 3. As we know, uh, chapter 3, uh, which is talking about financial ratios, uh, has four main uh, learning objectives or learning goals. The first one is to understand who uses the financial ratios and how. Uh, ratio analysis enables stockholders, lenders, and firms managers to evaluate the firm's financial financial performance. 
it can be performed on a cross-sectional or a time series basis. Benchmarking also is a popular type of cross-sectional analysis, as we uh, mentioned in the last section. Uh, also, users of uh, research should understand the cautions that apply to their use. The next uh, the next uh, learning objective is uh, using the ratios to analyze a firm's liquidity and activity uh, using the liquidity uh, ratios such as current ratio and the quick ratio and also using activity ratios that measures uh, the speed with which accounts are converted into sales or cash inflows or outflows uh, like inventory turnover, uh, receivable turnover uh, average collection period, uh, average payables uh, period, uh, and total asset turnover. The next uh, learning goal <clears throat> is to discuss the relationship between debt and financial leverage and the ratios used to analyze the firm's debt. So, as we know, the more the debt a firm uses, the greater its financial leverage, which, which means it magnifies both uh, risk and return. A common measure of indebtedness is the debt ratio, which is uh, uh, the total debt over the total assets. Uh, the ability to pay fixed charges can be measured by times interest earned and fixed payment coverage ratio, which determines the ability of the firm to pay uh, fixed charges over the time. The last learning goal is uh, using ratios to analyze firm's profitability and its market value. Uh, as we know, the common size income statement, which shows all the items as a percentage of sales, can be used to determine gross profit margin, rating profit margin, and net profit margin after deducting all the expenses uh, and the interest uh, the company owed. Other measures to uh, measure profitability include earning per share and return on assets and return on equity, which is the net income divided by the common stockholder equity. Also, market ratios include the price earnings ratio and the market uh, to book ratio, which measure the performance of the uh, uh, company's uh, return uh, related to the uh, price of the stock uh, related to the price of the share in the market or the book ratio or oh, sorry the book value uh, of the stock and these are the ratios uh, that you should memorize uh, for the exam uh, they are very important and a big part of the exam will be uh, on them okay so Let's, let's start uh, the questions giving the following income statement. What are the interest coverage ratio and net profit margin? And this is the income statement we have. So in order to uh, calculate the interest coverage ratio, we need the operating profit, which is the EBIT here, uh, and the interest paid, which is here. So, as we know, uh, interest coverage ratio is uh, operating profit divided by interest or EBIT divided interest. So, uh, the answer will be 115 divided by 15. And the uh, uh, net profit margin, to calculate it, we need to uh, get the uh, earning after taxes, the EAT or net profit, and divide it by the sales. So we need to divide 60 divided by uh, 200 in order to get the net profit margin. As we see here, uh, interest coverage ratio will be equal 7.67 and uh, net profit margin will be uh, 60 divided 20, uh, 200 as we uh, see. Uh, so the answer will be 0 0.3 or 30%. So the answer here would be A. Next question. Use the following data from Delta's common size financial statement to answer the following. What is Delta's after-tax return on equity? 
So in order to uh, calculate return on equity, we need a net income and a common uh, stockholder equity. So we have here, here uh, we have the return after tax, a percent from the sales. So first we need to multiply uh, the earning after tax uh, from the sales. Okay. Like here, we need first to uh, calculate the net income, which is 300. The sales multiply the percentage of the earning after taxes, which will give us uh, 54. Then we need to uh, calculate the equity or the common, uh, common shareholders equity, which is a percent of the total assets. So uh, we, will, we will multiply uh, 1,400 divided, uh, multiplied by 0.4 or 40%, which will give us 560. Then we can now uh, calculate the return on equity, which is the net income divided by the common equity. So 54 divided uh, 560 equal 9.6%. So the answer would be C. Okay. If the inventory turnover is 7, what is the average number of days the inventory is in stock? So in order to, uh, in order to uh, calculate the average number of days the inventory is in stock, we need to uh, uh, divide uh, 365 by the inventory turnover, like here. So the answer would be 365 divided by 7 which is 52 days, so the answer would be C. Okay. Earning before taxes, interest and taxes, the EBIT, is also known as earning before income tax, cross profit, or, or operating profit. Of course, uh, when we deduct the, gross pro uh, the cost of goods sold and then deduct all the operating uh, expenses, we get the EBIT, which is called also operating profit. So the answer is C. So next question. Giving the following uh, balance sheet for a company. What is the quick ratio for 2004? So uh, in order to calculate, calculate uh, the quick ratio, we need to uh, uh, take the cash and the account accounts receivable only and we will not include the inventory because uh, the inventory is only included in the current ratio as we know as we know okay so we will take uh, 450 and 660 and divided them by uh, current liabilities which in this case will be only the accounts payable which is the 550 so we will add 450 and uh, 660 we have no uh, marketable securities here so it will be zero zero and divide them by 550 and this will uh, give us 2.018 which is b so the answer is b an analyst has gathered the following information about the company cost of goods sold equals 65% uh, of the sales, inventory of uh, 450 thousands, and sales of 1 million. What is the value of this firm's average inventory processing period using a 365 day year? So in this uh, question, he wants, to, uh, wants us to calculate the average inventory period. Okay, in order, in order to calculate this uh, ratio we need uh, first to calculate the inventory turnover. In order to calculate the inventory turnover, we need first to uh, uh, calculate the number of uh, cogs or, or the cost of goods sold. So the cost of goods sold will be 65% multiplied by the sales on million, which will give us uh, 650 thousands. Then we can calculate the inventory turnover, which is the the COGS cost of goods sold divided by the inventory or average inventory, <coughs> which is 60, uh, 650 divided by 450 thousands, which will give us 1.44. Uh, 
Then you can calculate the average inventory processing period, which will be equal to 365 divided by 144, which will give us 252.7 days. So the answer will be A. Great. Next question. Giving the following information about a company. Receivables turnover equal 10 times. Payables turnover equal 12 times. Inventory turnover equal 8 times. What are the average receivables collection period? What are the average payables payment period? And what are the average inventory processing period respectively? So we just need to uh, uh, divide uh, 365 by these numbers in order to calculate each uh, period. So like this, average receivables collection period will be 365 divided 10. So it will be 37. Average payable turn, uh, actually average payables uh, payment period would be 365 divided by 12. So it would be 30. Uh, and the average inventory processing period will be 365 divided by 8. So it will be 46. And take care, we are rounding up. Uh, if this number is bigger than it's 5 or uh, more. If it's 4, we will round uh, down. If it's more than 5 or more, we will round up. So here it's 37, here will be 30, and 45.6 will be 46. So the answer here will be C. Next question. Giving the following income statement. What are the gross profit margin and the operating profit margin respectively? So in order to calculate these two ratios, gross profit margin is the gross profit divided by uh, the uh, sales, which is 145 divided by the net sales, which is uh, 200, and the operating profit margin will be the operating profit, which is 115 divided by the also uh, the net sales, which is 200, like this. 145 divided by uh, 200 will give us uh, 0 0.70, uh, 725 or 72.5 percent, and the operating profit margin will be 115 divided by 200, which will give us 57.5 uh, percent. So the answer here will be P. Which of the following ratios would not be used? Be careful here, would not be used to evaluate how efficiently management is utilizing the firm's assets. Fixed asset turnover, payables turnover, gross profit margin. <clears throat> so, in order uh, to know the answer here, we need to memorize first which ratios are used to uh, measure the efficiency of management, of management in utilizing the firm's assets. Uh, which are uh, these ratios are the activity ratios and uh, the only one that is considered as an activity ratio here is uh, the fixed asset turnover so the answer will be A which of the following is least likely a routinely used operating uh, profitability ratio and uh, let's be careful here he is uh, telling you least likely. So which one of these are the wrong one? Sales to total asset, uh, gross profit margin or gross profit divided by the net sales or uh, net income divided by sales. Of course, uh, sales to total asset is considered as uh, 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 an activity ratio, uh, not a profitability ratio. So the answer would be A. Income statements for Royal Inc. and for uh, for the years in the December uh, 31, uh, 2000 and December 31, 2001 were as follows. Analysis of these statements for trend in the operating 
in operating profitability revealed that with respect to Royals gross profit margin and net profit margin, what happened to those ratios? Gross profit margin decreased, but the net profit margin increased in 2001. Gross profit margin increased in 2001, and uh, but the net profit margin, uh, margin decreased. Both both uh, gross profit margin and net profit margin increased in 2001. First, in order to solve this question, we need to calculate the ratios in order to uh, make a trend analysis or time series analysis to know which one uh, increased and which one decreased. So, after calculating the gross profit margin in 2001, which will be 41.5%, while in 2002 uh, uh, it was 39.7%. Uh, so, this means that uh, the gross profit margin increased. While the net profit margin in 2001 uh, is 7.3%, uh, while in 2000 is 9 was 9%, which means that uh, the net profit margin decreased. Uh, so the answer here will be B. Okay. Comparing a company's ratios with those of its competitors is best described as common size analysis, longitudinal analysis, cross-sectional analysis, time series analysis. Uh, we know that from uh, from the last section, we know that uh, comparing the company's ratios with the competitors is considered as cross-sectional analysis, while comparing the ratios of the company at different point of time. Uh, this is considered as time series analysis. So uh, the answer here will be C. Paragon companies operating profits are one thousands, uh, sorry, hundred thousands. Interest expense is twenty five thousands, and earning before tax or net income are seventy five thousands. What are what is uh, Parag Paragon's interest covered? coverage ratio. Okay. In order to uh, sorry this earning before tax is not the net income. I'm sorry, this was a mistake. This is earning before tax, not after tax. So this is not the net income. Uh, so in order to uh, in order to uh, uh, calculate interest coverage ratio we need the earning before uh, interest and tax which is the EBIT, uh, which is also uh, the operating profit, and divided by the interest expense, which is here $25,000. Uh, so, as we can see, uh, $100,000 uh, $100, divided by $25,000 give us four times, which is the uh, uh, interest coverage ratio. So, the answer here will be B. Uh, this is considered as a case study, a small case study. Given this balance sheet and uh, this information, uh, the, the case study will ask to uh, answer some questions uh, related to these missing values and giving you this information. Sales totaled uh, 110,000, uh, gross profit margin was 25%. Inventory turnover was three times. Uh, there are 360 days in the year, so we are not dealing with 365 days in the year. We should be careful uh, about this. Uh, if it's not mentioned, then we are, we will use 365 as usual. If it's mentioned to use uh, 360, then you should use it. Okay. Uh, the average collection period was 65 days. The current ratio was 2.4 times. Total assets turnover was 1.13 times. And the last uh, debt ratio was 53.8%. Okay, let's see now the first question. Inventory for uh, CEE in 2013 was which of the following? So, in order to uh, calculate the inventory, 
refers to go back to the balance sheet uh, as we can see uh, we don't have the total current assets or the receivables so we can calculate we cannot calculate it directly uh, so uh, with this information we have the gross profit margin and the inventory turnover uh, so from we can uh, calculate the inventory uh, from the inventory turnover ratio but first we have to calculate the uh, cost of goods sold of course we do not have it here um, directly so we will calculate it from the gross profit margin as follows first we will calculate the gross profit which is the sales to multiply the gross profit margin which are here sales uh, multiply the gross profit margin which will give us 20 uh, uh, 27500 then we can calculate the cogs from the sales minus the, uh, the gross profit which will be 110 minus 27500 uh, which will give us 82500 this is uh, this is the uh, cost of goods sold so we have the uh, cost of goods sold and the inventory turnover so, so from this ratio we can calculate the inventory by dividing 82500 which is the cogs uh, by 3 which is the inventory turnover given here so the inventory would be 27500 dollars uh, which is C which is the answer it's pretty easy uh, but we need to memorize the, uh, the ratios very well in order to know the order on which you can follow so you can solve the question next in this question uh, it wants us to calculate the notes paper uh, first let's go to the uh, balance sheet see what are the, the givens we have uh, we want to calculate the notes payable but we only have the accounts payable and the accruals and we don't have the total current liabilities so in order to calculate the current liabilities we can do that using the current ratio we have here but in order to use it we have first to calculate the total current assets but in order to calculate the total current assets we must have the accounts receivable so how can we calculate the accounts receivable from this data we can calculate it from the average collection period so we can see that here sorry in order to uh, uh, calculate the accounts receivable from the average collection period we need to multiply the average collection period by the average sales per day we already know the average collection period is 65 so we can multiply it with the average sales which is given 110 thousands divided by 360 not 365 so the accounts receivable will be 19 uh, 861 so now we have both accounts receivable and inventory and we already given the cash so we can calculate the total current assets by summing these values like here current assets equal the cash 4500 uh, 4, plus 27500 the inventory plus 19861 which is the account receivable which will give us 51 861 dollars so we calculate the current assets now we can calculate the current liabilities from the current ratio as we said before uh, so the current uh, liabilities will be equal current assets divided by the current ratios current ratio sorry which will be 51 uh, 800 uh, 61 divided by 2.4 which is the current ratio this will give us 21,608 uh, now we can calculate the notes 
payable by uh, subtracting the uh, the accruals and the accounts payable that we are given here the accruals and the account accounts payable we can subtract them from the total current liabilities in order to get the notes payable just like here 21608 minus uh, 10,000 minus 1,000 will give us 10,608 which is the answer here will be D okay next question wants us to calculate uh, the accounts receivable which we already uh, calculated in the previous one as follows uh, the accounts receivable will be average collection period multiplied by average sales per day which is 65 multiplied by <clears throat> 110 thousands divided by 360 which will give us 19,861 uh, 19, which would be B okay now let's calculate net fixed assets for C in 2013 let's go back to the balance sheet As we can see here, uh, net fixed assets is not calculated and also total assets is not uh, calculated. But we have the total current assets. So we need to calculate the total assets in order to come up with the net fixed assets. Okay, how can we calculate the total assets? We here have here we have the total asset turnover, which is a net sales divided by the total assets. So from this ratio we can calculate the total assets by using the sales which is 110,000. So as we can see here, total assets equals sales divided by total asset turnover, which would be 110,000 divided by the uh, total asset turnover, which is 1.13. This will give us 97,345. Then we can calculate the net fixed assets by subtracting the, uh, the current assets from the uh, total assets, which will give us 45,484, uh, which in this case will be A, which is the answer. Okay. Next, we have to calculate the total assets. For CE, which is already have been calculated uh, in the previous uh, question, as follows: sales divided by the total uh, total assets turnover, which is 110,000 divided by 1.13, which will give us 97,345. 97, so the answer is D. Next question needs us to calculate uh, the long term debt for CE in 2013. So let's go back to the balance sheet again. And we can see here the long term debt is missing. Also, the total liabilities and stockholders' equity is missing. But we have the total current liabilities so in order to uh, calculate the, the long term debt we have to calculate the total liabilities and stockholder equity and how we can calculate this using we can calculate this using the debt ratio we can come up with the total debt okay without going to the stockholder equity we don't need it we just need the, need the total liabilities in order to come up with the long term debt okay we all we also know that the debt ratio uh, is a uh, total debt divided by the total assets so we can calculate it as follows total assets equal the not sorry not this total debt uh, will be equal total assets multiply the debt ratio in order to come up with the total debt which is 
97,345 multiplied by 53.8% or 0.538, which will give us $52,372, which is the total debt. Then we can come up with the long-term debt by subtracting the current liabilities from the total debt, which have been calculated here. So 52,372 minus 21,609, which is the total current liability, will give us the long-term debt, which is 30,763. So the answer here will be A. So easy, but we need to concentrate and memorize the ratios. Now we are going to solve some which were false uh, questions. The first one, uh, gross profit margin measures the percentage of each sales dollar left after the firm has paid its goods and operating expenses. This is false, of course because uh, gross profit margin we do not detect uh, sorry we do not uh, deduct operating expenses uh, in order to uh, calculate the gross profit margin when we deduct the goods and the gross profit margin uh, sorry and the operating when we deduct the goods cost of goods sold and the operating expenses uh, then we can calculate the operating profit margin not the gross profit margin okay next one Net profit margin measures the percentage of each dollar of each state's dollar remaining after uh, all after uh, after paying all the costs and expenses, including interest, taxes, and common stocks, have been deducted. So this is true. We can calculate the net profit margin after deducting all uh, the costs and expenses we have in uh, in this period. Uh, and uh, then we come up with the net profit then we divide it divide it by the sales net sales in order to come up with the net profit margin okay next question earnings per share represent the dollar amount earned and distributed to the shareholders okay that's false why because the dollar amount earned and distributed to the shareholders it's called dividends, not the earning per share. Okay. Next one. Return on total assets measures the overall effectiveness of the management in generating profit with its available assets. That's true. Okay. The price earning ratio or the PE ratio represent the degree of confidence that investors have in the firm future performance. That's also true. Okay. Typically, higher coverage ratios are preferred, but a very high ratio may indicate underutilization of fixed payments obligation, which may result in unnecessarily low risk and return. This is true. Because uh, this means that the company uh, do not rely on that enough, uh, which can be a benefit because uh, uh, the cost of that is uh, lower than the cost of equity. So the company needs to balance between the debt and the equity in order to uh, maintain its operation effectively. So uh, this is the last question for chapter three. Next, we will uh, revise chapter uh, four, which is the cash budgeting and uh, solve some problems on it okay uh, in chapter four we are uh, going to uh, solve problems about uh, cash budgeting this is uh, the only concept you took in chapter four uh, how to calculate cash receipts how to calculate uh, cash uh, disbursement uh, how to make a complete uh, cash uh, budgeting uh, so let's start with uh, question one uh, about cash receipts, a firm reported an actual sales of $65,000 in the month of June and $70,000 in the month of July. Uh, the sales forecast indicates that 
uh, sales are expected to be uh, 85, 92, and 95 to 150,000 for the months of August, September, October, uh, respectively. Sales are 60% uh, of cash and 40% on credit, and credit sales are collected evenly over two uh, over the following two months, uh, which means that. 40% uh, of the sales will be uh, split, uh, split evenly between uh, the following uh, two months. Uh, no other cash receipts were received. Uh, then what are the firm's expected cash receipts for the months August, September, and October? Okay, that's an easy question. Uh, let's see how to answer it. Okay, first... We will write the sales forecast for each month like this. Okay. Uh, then we need to calculate the cash sales, which is 60% of the total sales. So, in order to calculate this figure, we have to uh, multiply $65,000 for June, uh, multiply 60%, which will give us 39000 And the next month, we will uh, multiply 70000 uh, 70, uh, multiply 60%, which will be 42, and so on for each month. Then, uh, these are 60% only from the total sales. So we need to begin. Uh, we need to begin to calculate uh, the 40, the, the remaining 40% on credit uh, uh, on the following uh, two months. So, in order to uh, receive the the first. Uh, 20% of the uh, 65 for June, the first part will be in July, which is the $13,000. Uh, and the, uh, the next 20% uh, will be on the August uh, month here, okay? So, uh, for uh, July, this is the total receipts uh, received in July, which is totaled $54,000. Uh, for August, we will do the same thing. Uh, we will uh, we calculate the uh, cash sales, which is 60% of the total sales. Then we will uh, receive the uh, the one month lag or uh, the one month receivable of uh, July, which is the 20% of this uh, of this number, seventy thousand uh, uh, dollars. Then we receive the uh, second uh, accounts receivable. For the June uh, month, which is 13%, this is total to 40% of uh, $65,000. So the total uh, cash receipts uh, on August will be $78,000. And so on in September and October. First, we calculate the cash sales. Next, we calculate uh, the uh, the lagged uh, accounts receivables for the previous two months, uh, and calculate and then calculate the total cash receipts for this uh, month. So here we have the total cash receipts uh, as uh, followed. Okay. The next question. Uh, this question is about uh, calculating cash disbursements or cash outflows. The Coffee Specialist Corporation approached you to compile a cash disbursement schedule for the months March, April, and May. You would use the following information as a guide to prepare this schedule. Sales uh, for January uh, will be uh, 520,000, February 540, March 550, April 600, May 660, and June 670. Okay. Uh, the purchases are calculated as 70% of the following month's sales. Let's concentrate about this. Here, he is telling us that the purchases for each month will be calculated as 70% from the following sales month. Month sales, sorry. Okay, which means that uh, the purchases of January will be 70% of. Uh, uh, February sales and uh, February purchases will be 70% of March sales and so on. Then 50% of the 
of the purchases uh, which will be calculated later are made in cash and 30% of uh, purchases are settled after one month and the remaining 20% will be settled after two months after the purchase so we have uh, one month lag and two month lag for each purchase then we have the rent uh, paid uh, of 9,500 per month which is um, fixed every month then we have wages and salaries the fixed wage and salary cost are uh, 7,500 per month plus a variable cost of 6.5% uh, of the current month sales so which means that uh, uh, each month the wage and salaries will be uh, 7,500 plus 6.5% from the, this month's uh, uh, sales so uh, for the for, for example for the January it will be 7,500 uh, plus 6.5% uh, of the uh, January sales which is a $520,000 uh, okay then we have uh, the tax bill to be paid in May uh, amount to uh, fifty-seven uh, five hundred dollars, which is uh, one amount in one month only. Uh, then we have fixed assets, the fixed asset outlays. Uh, new equipment will be acquired during March at the cost of eighty-five thousand, which is also uh, one payment. Then we have interest payment of thirty-two uh, thousand due in uh, March, which is also one payment in March. And last, we have dividends of 15,000, which will be paid one time in April. Okay, let's see the answer together. Okay, first of all, to calculate, as we uh, uh, told you, uh, to calculate the purchases for January, we need to uh, multiply the sales of February by 70% or 0.7 which will give us uh, uh, 378 thousands this is the purchases of January then for February we will take the uh, sales of March and multiply it by uh, 0.7 which will give us 385 thousand dollars as a purchase in February and in March we will take the April sales figure and uh, multiply it by 0.7 or 70 percent so we can uh, we can calculate the purchases of March and so on okay then we need to calculate the cash purchase which is as they told us here 50 percent of the purchases made in cash okay so uh, we need to multiply uh, three seven eight thousands multiply by uh, 50 percent to in order to calculate the cash purchase which is which would be uh, 189 thousands and the same thing for the uh, following uh, months we will multiply 385 thousands multiply uh, 0.5 or 50 percent so uh, to calculate the 192 500 thousand dollars and so on so uh, here we calculated the cash purchase now we have to calculate the first uh, lag month or lag month uh, for the accounts payable payments okay we are told here that 30 percent will be settled one month after the purchase so in order to calculate uh, the remaining amount of uh, purchase uh, that will be due uh, uh, on the next month we need to calculate uh, to uh, multiply this figure which is the three eight uh, seven eight thousand dollars multiplied by the uh, 30 percent which is the purchases are set which are settled after one month so this number will come up from uh, three seven eight thousand multiplied by 30 percent which will give us the first uh, one month lag next we have uh, in March we need to calculate the first lag also which will be 30% of the uh, 385 
figure which is the purchase of February uh, uh, we have we need to uh, to pay 30% of it next month uh, and so on uh, uh, also for April we'll do the same thing to calculate the uh, one month lag which will be 30% of 40, uh, 420 and finally for May will be 30% uh, of uh, 462 uh, dollars okay so uh, in order to calculate the two month lag here we are we are given that the remaining 20% uh, of the total purchases we will uh, will be settled uh, over the next two months so uh, in order to calculate this figure we need to multiply 20% by 378 so we can settle the uh, full amount of the purchase in Jan uh, over uh, three months the first month was uh, in Jan which is was, uh, which was quite uh, in cash then we have uh, 113 400 which it was uh, uh, payables and the, the, the last month uh, 75600 which was the uh, second uh, month okay so in order to calculate this figure we need to multiply 20% by 378 thousands uh, to uh, calculate the remaining payable for this purchase and in the next month we will calculate 20% uh, uh, of the total sales of February which is three eight uh, five thousand dollars and for uh, May we will calculate 20% uh, from the four hundred and twenty uh, thousand purchases of March uh, so we have uh, calculated the cash purchases and uh, uh, payables of the uh, these uh, purchases then we will continue to uh, record the rest of the disbursement or the cash outflows we have in the following month so we have here the firm pays uh, rent uh, of 9,500 9, per month so we will record of course we are uh, uh, we are uh, making this uh, cash disbursement, disbursement sc schedule for March, April, and May. So these uh, fixed uh, amounts we will, uh, will we will record it only on these uh, these months. So the rent, pay uh, rent payments will be recorded in March, April, and May, uh, and so on. Uh, in wages and uh, salaries, as we are told here, the fixed uh, wage and salary costs are 7,500 per month plus a variable cost of 6.5% of the current month sales so uh, for uh, sorry for uh, March uh, the wage and salary will be 7,500 okay uh, and plus uh, the 6.5% of the February uh, sorry of the March uh, uh, for the March sales, which is uh, 550, multiply by 6.5%. Uh, okay, uh, then we add uh, 7,500 7, in order to come up with this figure, which is 43,250, and so on. For April, we will uh, take, uh, we will uh, calculate uh, 7,500 again, and plus uh, the uh, six point five percent of the uh, total sales of April, which is the uh, six thousand uh, six hundred uh, thousand uh, dollars, and so on for uh, May. Okay, then we have taxes, which will be paid uh, in May only of uh, by amount uh, of uh, fifty seven five hundred which will be here as follows okay then we have a net fixed assets outlay or fixed assets outlay which will be paid on March only of 85,000 as follows then we have interest payments which is uh, 32 only due in March like here 32,000 uh, and finally, we have cash dividends of 15,000 will be paid in April. So it will be recorded here as follows. So 
we recorded all the cash disbursement for each month as follows then we need to calculate the total cash disbursement for each month we will be uh, we will add or uh, we will add uh, cash purchase plus cash uh, the payables of uh, lagged uh, for one month and the lag for two months and then we add the pay rent payments wages and, uh, and salaries uh, taxes is we if we have uh, taxes for this month uh, fixed uh, assets outlay interest payment and then cash dividends if we have uh, in this month and then we come up with the total cash disbursement for each month like this okay let's go to the next question uh, Jerry Jacobs a financial analyst for the best value supermarkets has prepared the following sales and cash disbursement estimates for the period of August through December or the current year as we can see here from this table uh, we have the August September October no uh, November and December months and uh, the sales for each month and the cash the opposite cash disbursement for each month so in this uh, in this uh, question we will do a full cash budgeting uh, schedule for this company as we can see here we have uh, some information as 90 percent of the sales are made of cash and the remaining will be meaning 10 percent are collected on one month later so we only have one month lag not two months uh, all disbursements are on cash basis so uh, all will be occurred in the same month no lag in the cash disbursement the firm wishes to maintain a minimum cash balance of 50 so uh, it, the, it, each month the, the company must have a minimum cash balance of 50 dollars uh, the beginning cash balance in September is $25 so prepare a cash budget for the months of October, November and December noting any needed finances or excess cash uh, available so uh, when we calculate the, uh, the cash budget uh, and we will find that if there are any uh, needed finance we if we have yeah, of course uh, 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 cash deficit so we will need to finance it uh, or, or, or when we have uh, uh, cash excess in cash we will need to invest it so uh, let's see the uh, the answer together so first of all uh, we need to calculate the total cash receipts and in order to calculate it uh, we need to calculate the cash sales uh, first which will be, uh, as we said before, 90% of the sales will be in cash. So uh, the sales, the cash uh, sales for September will be 500 multiply 90%, which will give us uh, for $50. Okay, and for uh, October will be the same thing: 500 uh, multiplied by 90%, and November 600 multiply. 90% uh, and December 700 multiply 90% uh, which will give us 630 uh, or 634 uh, December then we need to calculate the uh, the one month lag for the uh, sales on credit for September we will uh, calculate uh, uh, for uh, for the 400 uh, of uh, sales of August multiply 10% in order to calculate uh, Calculate the remaining uh, uh, sales to be collected in this month, which will be 40. Uh, then we will calculate 10% from the 500 uh, of sales in September. Uh, that will be due on, or uh, that uh, we will receive on uh, October, and so on. Uh, this uh, this 50 is uh, the 10% of the. Uh, September sales and this 50 will be 10% uh, of the October sales and uh, this uh, $60 will be uh, the 10% of November sales okay so uh, after adding the cash sales and the, uh, the one month uh, sales lagged th uh, sales 
we will uh, calculate then the total cash receipts by adding these two numbers or 50 plus 40 or 50 plus 50 and so on uh, next we will need to calculate the total cash disbursement as we know that uh, all the cash disbursement are on cash basis so no uh, lag uh, in it so we will take uh, each month uh, cash disbursement, disbursement and we will put it here uh, for September uh, it is 500 uh, and 700 for October 400 November and 500 for December then we will need to uh, calculate the net cash flow which is here by subtracting the total cash uh, subtracting the total cash disbursement from the total cash receipts so in the first month we have a negative cash flow okay in the second in the October we will have 200 uh, cash uh, net cash flow negative uh, 200 cash outflow uh, then we uh, in November we have uh, 190 dollars cash surplus and then in the December we have 190 cash surplus also okay so we know that in September and October we have cash deficit and in November and December we have cash surplus okay then we are told that the beginning balance in September is $25 so in order to uh, calculate the ending cash balance we need to add this uh, beginning balance so the beginning balance is in September was $25 by adding these two numbers of course this is a negative number so the uh, the total or the ending by cash balance will be $15 then in October the beginning balance is the ending balance of the previous uh, month which is $15 so by adding these two numbers we will have uh, then a negative number which is a, a cash deficit of 185 uh, then in the next month we will take the ending balance of the previous month previous uh, month which is 185 and then we add uh, these two numbers in this case this is a negative number so it will be a subtraction so the remaining will be uh, five dollars only uh, then at December we will take uh, the ending balance of November and add uh, net cash flow plus beginning cash balance to uh, to compute or to calculate the uh, ending cash balance of 195 okay then we are told that the minimum cash uh, balance required uh, for the company to maintain its operation is $50 each month so we need to uh, subtract this number from the ending cash balance in order to know if we have excess cash or uh, deficit in order to finance so for the first month we will need to subtra uh, subtract uh, 50 dollars from 15 dollars which is a cash ending cash balance so we will have a negative 35 dollars which we are is, which is required financing in the next month uh, we will subtract uh, 185 uh, 50 from negative 185 which will give us a negative uh, 235 which is a, a deficit also so it will be a required financing uh, then in the next month uh, we will uh, subtract 50 uh, uh, from the index uh, cash balance so it will give it uh, give us a negative 45 which is also a cash deficit so it is required to finance it and in the last uh, month uh, we will subtract 50 from uh, uh, the ending balance which is 195 which will give us an excess cash of uh, 145 so as a conclusion here from uh, these two lines uh, we can say that the best value markets should arrange a line of credit at least for 235 dollars during the four month period in order to cover uh, these deficits and in the last uh, in the last uh, month this 145 or uh, $145 can be uh, because it's an excess in cash it can be uh, an investment in marketable securities so let's go to the next question
in the preparation of quarterly cash budget, the following revenue and cost information have been compiled. Prepare and evaluate the cash budget for the months of October, November, and December based on the following information. Here we have the uh, actual and forecast sales and purchases for August, September, October, November, and December. We need to forecast for these uh, the cash budget uh, for these, uh, these uh, three months. Also, we have uh, another information. The firm collects 60% of the sales uh, of the sales for cash and the 40% of its sales uh, on one uh, one month later, which means that we have only uh, one uh, leg like one month only. Uh, interest income of uh, 50%, uh, sorry, 50 thousands on marketable securities will be received in December. So we have uh, another cash receipt here uh, of 50% uh, 50 thousands uh, dollar in December. Uh, then we have uh, then we have the purchases. The firm pays cash 40% of its purchase. Then the rest uh, will be paid on the following months, which we have, which mean we have a one leg uh, accounts payable, one month leg accounts payable. Uh, then uh, salaries and wages amount to 15% of the preceding month sales, which mean that the uh, the salaries and wages of uh, September will be 15% of the August sales, which is the 3 million, and so on. Sales commissions amount to 2% of the preceding month's sales, also, which means that uh, the sales commission of September will be 2% of the August sales figure, which is the 3 million, and so on. Then we have a lease payment of uh, 100,000 must be paid each month regularly. <clears throat> a principal uh, and interest payment on an outstanding loan is due in December of uh, 150 uh, thousands, which is a one payment. Okay, let's see the rest of the information. The firm pays dividend of uh, 50,000 at the end of the quarter, uh, which, which means that uh, this is, uh, will be paid uh, in December. Uh, fixed asset costing 600,000. Six, uh, uh, dollars uh, will be purchased in December. Okay, this is only uh, one payment. Uh, and depreciation expense each month uh, of forty-five thousand uh, dollars. This will not be uh, taken into consideration because uh, depreciation expense is a non-cash expense, so there is no cash to be paid. And finally, the firm has a beginning cash balance on in October of uh, one hundred thousand uh, thousands dollars and maintain a minimum cash balance of $200,000. Okay, let's see the answer together. First, always first, we need to start with calculating the total cash receipts. Okay, uh, so uh, here we have the sales uh, for each month. Okay, then we need to calculate the cash sales for each month, which is 60% of the total sales. So, uh, in order to come up with this figure, we need to uh, multiply 3 million by th uh, 60%. Uh, so to calculate the cash sales in August and in September, we will multiply uh, uh, 4, 4 million 500 by uh, 60% to come up with uh, 2 million 700. And uh, in October, we will uh, multiply 1 million by 60% in order to come up with uh, 600 thousands and so on for the preceding uh, for the next month. Next, we need to calculate the one month leg accounts payable, uh, which is 40% uh, of the uh, preceding uh, uh, month. So, uh, for August, we don't have uh, previous months, so we will go to September uh, in order to come up with this figure. We will uh, multiply uh, the, the 3 million sales of August by 40% to uh, calculate the remaining 40% of this uh, sales. Uh, then in October, we will uh, multiply uh, the 40% by uh, the sales of uh, September, which is a 4 million 500 to come up with 1 million uh, 800 and so on for the next two months. Okay. 
and last uh, cash receipts which is the interest here as we are told here we have an interest income of fifty thousand uh, dollar received in december so it will be accounted in uh, december so in order to calculate the total receipts we will sum up all these numbers together and calculate or to come up with the total receipts for each month next we will calculate the uh, purchases here we have the purchases amount of purchase each month as follows so in order to uh, the next thing we will calculate the uh, cash sales uh, sorry cash purchases for each month we know that uh, uh, in, the, in the given information uh, the firm uh, pay cash 40 only 40 percent paid in cash for its purchase and the the remaining 60 percent will be uh, paid uh, in the following month uh, so as you can see here uh, the cash uh, purchase will only be 40 percent of the total purchase so we will multiply 3 uh, million 500 by uh, 40 percent in order to come up with uh, the cash purchase in august and uh, next month we will calculate it by uh, multiplying 40 percent by uh, 2 million to come up with the 800,000 uh, figure uh, then we will calculate the cash uh, so the cash uh, purchase for october by multiplying 5000 uh, 5000 dollars by 40 percent which will give us 200 thousand dollars and so on for the remaining uh, months then we need to calculate the one month lag of course we don't have here uh, in august uh, uh, a one month uh, payables so, so we will start with uh, september uh, by multiplying the 60 percent uh, the remaining amount of the purchase by the uh, the purchase uh, of august which is the uh, three million five hundred multiplied 60 percent will give us uh, two million one hundred and for the october we will calculate the one month accounts payable uh, through multiplying 60 percent by 2 million which will give us uh, 1 million 200 uh, and so on for november and december next we have uh, salaries and wages which is given here salaries and wages are amount uh, to 15 percent of the preceding uh, or the previous month sales so in order to calculate it we will need to uh, multiply 15 uh, uh, for September, we, we, for, uh, to calculate the uh, salaries and wages for uh, September, we will uh, multiply 15% uh, by 3 million, which is the sales of August, in order to come up with the uh, $450,000. And for October, we will uh, multiply 15% by the uh, 4,500,000 sales of September. So we can calculate the salaries and wages of uh, October and so on for november and december next we have a sales commission which is given here a two percent of the preceding month sales so we will do the, uh, the same thing i think as um, as we did in uh, salaries and wages uh, first we will calculate uh, this uh, figure by multiplying two percent by the three million uh, sales of august and for October, we will uh, multiply uh, the two million, uh, sorry, the two percent by the salary as uh, a sales, sorry, uh, of September, which is four million five hundred. And for uh, for November, we will multiply two percent by uh, multiply the sales figure of the October of October, which is one million. So it will give us one fifty million, uh, one fifty uh, uh, thousands and so on for December okay next we have uh, lease payments as we are given here uh, lease payments of uh, $100,000 must be made each month so uh, we will add uh, $100,000 uh, each month as a lease payments as here then we have uh, the principal and interest payment which is a uh, one payment at December by 150 as, uh, as it's given here 
next we has uh, we have uh, dividends to be paid at the end of the quarter which is uh, December of uh, $50,000 which is recorded here and finally we have a fixed asset purchase of $600,000 at uh, also at December which is recorded here so uh, next we need to calculate the total disper disbursements for each uh, month uh, by adding uh, these uh, numbers 800 thousands plus 2 million 100 plus 450 plus 60 plus uh, 100 thousands in order to come up with the total disbursement which is the 3 million 510 uh, for September and the same thing we can do the same thing for October November and December in order to come up with the total disbursement so uh, then we have uh, to calculate the net cash flow in order to know if we have a cash deficit or cash surplus. Uh, we can do this by subtracting the total disbursements for each month uh, from the total receipts. Uh, so in order to come up with the net cash flow, we need to uh, uh, make uh, 3 million 900 uh, minus uh, 3 million 510, which will give us uh, three, uh, 390 uh, thousands which is the net cash flow and a cash surplus for September and the same thing we can do the same thing with October we will uh, subtract uh, uh, 2 million 256 from 2 million 400 which is the total receipts which will give us a net cash surplus of 135 uh, and so on for November and December then we are going to add the uh, beginning cash balance, which we have here for October, uh, $100,000. Uh, so uh, the ending cash balance for October will be $235,000. Then to calculate the November uh, ending balance, we will take the beginning, the ending balance of uh, October as the beginning balance uh, of uh, for November. So we will add uh, 400, 4,000 uh, and uh, 4, 430, sorry, 430,000 uh, plus 235,000. Uh, so to come up with the ending cash balance uh, for November, which is 665,000. And the same thing for the December, for the th December. Uh, then we will uh, subtract the minimum cash balance required by the firm to maintain its operations uh, which is $200,000 each month uh, so we will subtract uh, 200,000 from 235 uh, so to come up with uh, the excess cash we have here for October which is 35,000 and excess cash in uh, November and December so uh, for the forecasted three months we have uh, excess cash uh, all over the period uh, and this uh, excess cash we can uh, invest it in uh, marketable securities in order to uh, gain income on it okay next question uh, farmers delight corporation reported states of uh, 350 thousands in uh, june 380 in july 390 in august the forecasts for september october november are uh, 385 for uh, 418 and 421 uh, 29 sorry uh, respectively the initial cash balance uh, of uh, September will be uh, 150 thousand dollars and the minimum cash required uh, is eight thousand uh, dollar okay also we have another information uh, like farmers like predicts that 5% of its sales will never be collected so we will collect only 95% of the total sales 30% of them will be uh, cash sales and the remaining 65% will be collected in the following month which means we have one month uh, bank accounts receivable Next, Farmers Delight receives uh, other monthly income 
of uh, $3,000. So we have another cash receipts of $3,000 each month. Uh, the, the actual or expected purchases are $150, $120, and $115,000 for the months of September to November, uh, respectively. And 50% of them are paid in cash, while a reminder is paid in the following months, which means we have one month lag accounts payable. The purchases of, for August were $120,000. Then we have monthly rent uh, of $3,500, chargeable only in October and November, so it will not be uh, included in uh, September. Wages and salaries are 12% of the previous uh, previous month uh, sales. Okay. Cash dividends of 4,600 are declared, declared and will be paid in September only. Long-term loan repayment and principal and uh, of principal and interest of 4,700 is due in October only. Uh, additional equipment costing 8500 is ordered and scheduled to be paid in cash or total in cash in November and finally uh, taxes of 8250 are due in November so let's see the answer together first of all we need to cal calculate the uh, total cash receipts in order to do that, we will uh, put first the sales figures for each month like that. Then we will calculate uh, the uh, cash sales for each month. Of course, we need only uh, we have only one month lag for accounts receivable and uh, accounts payable, so we will only need uh, this figure to uh, calculate the uh, collection of AR and collection of AP which is uh, accounts receivable and accounts payable. Uh, so we will start uh, calculating the cash sales for September, which will be 30% uh, as given here, 30% uh, will be cash sales. So uh, we will uh, multiply the uh, $385,000 multiplied by uh, 30%, which will give us $115,500. Thousand uh, dollars, and for October the th same thing. We will multiply uh, four hundred and eighteen thousand uh, dollars multiplied by uh, three, uh, thirty percent, which will give us one twenty-five four hundred, and so on for November. Then we will calculate the uh, collection of accounts receivable, which will be uh, the remaining sixty-five percent of the uh, previous months. So for September, uh, we will uh, calculate it uh, by uh, multiplying 65% uh, by the uh, $390,000, uh, which is the sales of August, in order to calculate the remaining sales or uh, collection of AR in September. Uh, next, we will, uh, for October, we will multiply 65% by uh, 385 thousand uh, dollars in order to come up with uh, two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars and two hundred and fifty uh, dollars and for November we will uh, calculate it uh, by multiplying uh, 65 percent by uh, four hundred and eighteen thousand dollars so next we will uh, calculate the other income it is actually a given number we won't uh, calculate it but but we will add it in September, October, and November, respectively. Then we will add uh, the, all the cash receipts we have, which is uh, $115,500 and $253,000 and $3,000. And that will give us the $371,500, uh, uh, which is the total cash receipts for September and so on for October and November. Next, we will calculate the uh, purchases uh, for the uh, for each month, which is uh, the the beginning of the uh, total cash disbursements. Uh, so we have here uh, 
the total purchases for each month then we need to calculate the cash purchase which is given here uh, it will be paid 50% in cash and the remainder will be paid the following month which is also 50% so cash purchases will be 50% uh, of uh, uh, 150 which is this number uh, then uh, uh, for October to calculate the cash uh, purchase we will uh, multiply 50% uh, by $120,000 which will give us $60,000 uh, then for November we will uh, multiply 50% by $115,000 which will give us uh, $57,500 okay next we will uh, Next, we will uh, uh, calculate the accounts payable or the one month lag of cash purchases in order to come up with the first month, which is September. We will uh, multiply 50% by uh, this number, which is uh, August purchases, which is uh, $120,000. So this will give us $60,000 and the same thing for uh, October and November. In October, we will multiply 50% uh, uh, by uh, $150,000, uh, which will give us $75,000 for October and so on. Next, we have rent payments, which will be, uh, which is a fixed amount, will, which will be paid uh, only in October and November, as follows. Next, we have uh, wages and salary which, which is a percent as you can see here uh, which is a percent of the previous month sales 12 percent of the previous month sales so in order to calculate this we will multiply 12 percent by for September we will uh, multiply 12 percent by uh, uh, three uh, three thousand nine and ninety thousand dollars for uh, August which is the sales of August in order to come up with, with uh, to come up with uh, forty six thousand dollars and eight hundred, and for October we will multiply the twelve percent by the three eight five thousand dollars of uh, for the sales of September, uh, in order to come up with forty six two hundred dollars thousand dollars for October and so on for November. Next, we have fixed asset outlays, which is, uh, sorry, we have first taxes, which is a fixed amount as given here, uh, 8,250 will be due in November, and this is where we should put it. Next, we have a fixed asset outlays, which is uh, total 8,500, which will be paid also in November. Uh, then we have uh, uh, sorry. Uh, then we have interest uh, and principal payment, which is also uh, a one payment in uh, October. And finally, we have cash dividend to be paid in September, also one time only. So we added all the uh, cash uh, disbursements we have each month. So now we will calculate the total cash disbursement for each month by adding uh, these numbers together. Uh, 75 plus 60 plus 46,800 plus 4,600, which will give us the total $186,400. And the same thing uh, for October and November. Then we will come up with the net cash flow in order to know uh, if we have a cash uh, deficit or cash uh, surplus. So we will subtract the total cash disbursement, which is this number, from the total cash receipts, which is this number, in order to come up with the net cash flow, which is 185,100, uh, which is uh, a positive number. So we have a cash surplus uh, in September. And we'll do the, th the, theme, uh, the same thing uh, for October and November. And as we can see, the uh, two numbers are positive, which mean that 
they are also a cash surplus. Then we will add the beginning cash. We here have we are given that the beginning cash uh, of September is one fifty thousand dollars. So uh, to calculate the ending cash balance for September, we will add these two numbers. 185,100 uh, plus 150,000 dollars, which will give us 300,000 uh, dollars. So, in order to calculate the, uh, the ending balance for October, we will uh, take the ending balance of September and become the beginning balance of October and add both these two numbers together to come up with the ending balance of October and so on. Uh, for November. Then we will uh, subtract the minimum cash balance required to, for the company to maintain its operations, which is $8,000 each month. So in order to know the excess cash we have or the deficit uh, we have, we will subtract the $8,000 from uh, the $3,000 uh, $300,035 thousand uh, dollars and so on and it will give us this number which is a positive number which means that we have an excess cash balance in September and so on in October and November uh, so as long as we have an excess cash during this, uh, this period uh, the company can uh, invest it in marketable securities in order to gain income on it uh, this is the end of chapter 4 and next we will uh, discuss chapter 8 risk and return uh, together inshallah so uh, now let's discuss uh, chapter 8 chapter 8 is talking about uh, the concept of risk and return so in this chapter you should know uh, what are what is the definition of return and the risk and how to calculate the return of a single stock or a single asset and uh, how to calculate the risk of a, a single stock or an asset and then uh, how to measure uh, the riskness of an asset uh, relative to its uh, return so let's start with the questions question one which of the following is true of risk and return uh, trade-off a risk can be measured based on a based on the variability of return that's true. Risk and return are inversely proportional to each other. Of course, this is not true. Uh, risk and return are directly proportional. Whenever the risk increases, the return increases. Uh, so, uh, T bills are riskier than uh, equity. That's not true. T bills are the safest instrument found on the earth. Uh, riskier investments tend to have lower returns. That's also. Uh, false. Uh, so the answer here would be A. Which of the following is true of risk? Risk and return are inversely proportional. No, it's not true. Uh, higher, higher the risk associated with the, sec with the uh, security, the lower the return. No, that's not true. Risk is the measure of the uncertainty surrounding the return that an investment will earn. That's a true one. Risk is considered as the uncertainty. Uh, regarding the return uh, of an asset or an investment. So the answer here would be C. The total return of an investment over a given period of time is calculated by dividing the asset's cash distribution during the period plus change in the value by, uh, uh, by its beginning of period investment value that's true. Uh, dividing the assets cash distribution during the period plus change in value, uh, then by divided by its ending uh, ending period investment value. Mm, that's not true. I think the A is uh, the answer here, as you know from the equation of uh, measuring rate of return. So the answer is A. If a manager prefers a higher return return investment regardless of its risk then uh, he is a he is following a risk seeking strategy risk neutral 
risk averse or risk aware uh, of course because uh, he is uh, uh, he prefers a higher return regardless of the risk this means he is a risk neutral so the answer here will be b if a manager prefers investments with greater risk even if they have lower expecting return then he is following which of the following strategies risk seeking risk indifferent risk averse risk neutral the answer here will be uh, a risk seeking because whenever uh, the manager uh, prefer uh, going uh, with a great risk without considering uh, the return he is considered as a risk seeking manager okay next question risk aversion is the behavior exhibited by managers who require an increase in return for a given decrease in risk uh, no that's not true an increase in return for a given increase in risk yes that's true uh, because risk aversion means that uh, whenever the risk is increasing I, the manager should uh, require more return for this uh, increase in risk so the answer is B okay. if a manager requires greater return when risk increases uh, then he is said to be a risk averse as we said before so the answer is C Tim purchased a bounce house one year ago for 6,500 during the year it generated 4,000 in cash flow if Tim, if Tim uh, sells the bounce, uh, the bounce house today he could receive 6,100 for it what would be his rate of return under these uh, these conditions so in order to calculate the rate of return first we must uh, add as you can see we we should uh, first add the cash generated during the year which is the four thousand uh, then uh, calculate the difference between uh, the price today which is the 6100 minus uh, the price that he bought the house with which is the 6500 so uh, and divided them by the beginning price which is the uh, 6500 uh, so as follows the equation would be like that and the answer would be 55.338% Okay. Uh, for this equation this is P for time 1 and P for T minus 1 which is the ending uh, price and the beginning price T minus 1 is the beginning uh, price this is not PT uh, and then subtract 1 okay let's be uh, clear about that okay next question asset A was purchased six months ago for uh, $25,000 and has generated uh, $1,500 cash flow during the period. Which of the following, which, uh, what is the assets rate of return if it can be sold today for $26,750? So here we again uh, calculating the rate of return, uh, but here the period is only six months. And the rate of return is an annual return. Always, it's an annual return. So, first we will cal we will calculate the rate of return as usual. Uh, the cash flow, which is uh, 1,500, plus the difference between the ending uh, price minus the beginning price divided by the beginning price, which will give us 13%. Then, to convert this semi-annual rate to an annual rate of return. We will multiply it by two, so the annual rate of return will be 13% by multiply by two, which is 26%. Great. A common approach of estimating the variability of returns involved involving the uh, forecasting of pessimistic, most likely and optimistic returns associated with an asset. 
It's called marginal analysis, scenario analysis, break even analysis, Dupont analysis. Uh, the answer here uh, is B, which is scenario analysis, because we are forecasting different uh, scenarios for the same asset. Okay. Which of the following is the, is the extent of an asset's risk? It is found by subtracting the pessimistic outcome from the optimistic outcome. Okay, whenever we are subtracting the best outcome from the worst outcome, we are uh, calculating uh, something called the range. Okay, so the answer here will be D. Which of the following is a measure? Uh, that measures the dispersion around the expected value. Okay, uh, coefficient of variation, uh, chi square, mean, standard deviation. Uh, okay, whenever we uh, calculating the dispersion or the variability of the uh, return around the expected value, this uh, means that we are calculating the standard deviation. So the answer will be D. So next question. Uh, which of the following is a measure of a relative dispersion used in comparing the risk of an asset with differing expected returns? Coefficient of variation, g square mean standard deviation. Uh, of course, g square is considered as a probability distribution, so this is not yet the answer. Uh, the mean is considered is, uh, as uh, the expected return. And standard deviation is a measure of risk of an absolute risk or absolute dispersion. Uh, so the answer here will be A, which is the coefficient of variation, which is the uh, standard deviation divided by uh, the return. So it is a relative dispersion, a measure of a relative dispersion used to compare the risk with the expected return for a given asset. Okay, next question. Assuming the following returns and corresponding probabilities for an asset for an asset A, compute the, its standard deviation and coefficient of variation. Okay, in order to uh, compute the standard deviation first, we need to come up with the expected return. So, as here, uh, in order to calculate the uh, standard deviation, uh, sorry, uh, the expected return. First, we need to uh, multiply the, uh, each actual return uh, multiplied by its probability in order to come up with the expected return. So the first return multiply 10% multiply 30%, which will give us uh, 3%. Uh, then 15% uh, multiply by 40%, which will give us 6%. 20% uh, uh, actual return multiply its probability 30% which will give us also 6% uh, expected return. Then we sum up these numbers in order to come up with the expected return, which will be 15% in this case. Then in order to uh, calculate uh, the uh, variance, we have to uh, subtract first the uh, actual return minus the expected return in order to uh, know uh, the variance between the expected and the actual returns, okay, then uh, made it a power of 2, and then multiplied by its probability again. So the first variance will be 7.5, the second variance will be 0 because it will be 15 minus 15, which will give us 0, and then uh, we will, uh, and the last one will be 20, which is the actual return, minus 15, which is uh, uh, the expected return, uh, a power of 2 multiply its probability which is 30 percent will give us 7.5 percent then we uh, add up this uh, variances together in order to come up with the, uh, the final variance for this asset which is 15 percent uh, and in order to come up with the standard division we need to make square root for this 15 percent here so the uh, the standard deviation will be 38.7%. Then to calculate the uh, coefficient of variation, we will uh, divide the standard deviation, which is the 38.7% by the expected return, 
which is 15%, like here, so the, so the coefficient of variation will be 2.6. Okay, I think that's clearly clear enough. Let's go to the uh, next question. <clears throat> Greenwich Inc., a successful nursery, is considering several expansion projects. All the alternatives promise to produce an acceptable return. Data on four possible projects as follows. Project A, B, C, and D. And given each one uh, its corresponding expected return, uh, the range between the, uh, the, uh, the optimistic uh, scenario and the pessimistic scenario, and then we have the standard deviation for each of the expected returns. Okay, the first question, which project is least risky judging based on the range? So as you can see here, uh, project A has the lowest range, which means it has the lowest risk according to the range. Okay, next question, which project has the, has the lowest standard deviation? and explain why standard deviation may not be an entirely appropriate measure of risk for purposes of this comparison. Okay, as we can see here, the lowest uh, standard deviation will be also uh, project A. And let's see why uh, the standard deviation measures fail to uh, consider both because uh, standard deviation uh, measures fail to uh, consider both the volatility and the return of the investment, investor would prefer a higher return but less volatility. So in order to uh, measure uh, this relative relationship, we need to use the coefficient of variation, which measure, uh, which, uh, which is a measure, a measure that considers both aspects uh, of investor's preference, which are the, uh, the volatility and the return. So the final question is to calculate the uh, assets of the four projects coefficient of variation, which will uh, be like that. We will uh, uh, divide the standard deviation for each project by its, uh, sorry, the expected return for each project by its standard deviation as follows, and then compare uh, the uh, coefficient of variation for each project and pick the lowest one, which is in this case project D. Uh, project D, sorry, is the best alternative because it provides the least amount of risk for each percent of return earned. And the coefficient of variation is probably the best measure in this instance because it provides a standardized method of measuring the risk and return trade-off for investments with differing returns. Okay, let's uh, solve some uh, true and false questions. Investment A guarantees its holder a hundred dollar return, and investment B earns zero or a two hundred with equal chances, an average of hundred dollars over the same period. Both both investments have equal risks. Of course, this is false. Because investment A is a guaranteed investment and the other have a probability of earning nothing. So uh, the project B or investment B is considered uh, riskier than, the, than investment A. So next question. The return of an, on an asset is the change in its value plus any cash distribution over the period expressed as a percentage of its ending value. No, that's not true uh, because uh, it is expressed as a percentage of its beginning value, not the ending value, as we can see from the uh, equation uh, shown before. So next question. For a risk averse manager, a required rate a return would decrease for an increase in risk. That's not true. We all know that uh, risk averse manager require an increase in uh, in return uh, for uh, any increase that happened in the risk. Okay, so this is false. The term risk is used is used interchangeably uh, with the uncertainty to refer to the variability of return associated with the, a given asset. 
that's true okay the range of an asset's risk is found by subtracting the worst outcome from the best outcome okay this is true about the range uh, larger the larger the difference between assets worst outcome from its best outcome the higher the risk of an asset yes that's true the higher the range uh, the higher the risk of the asset okay uh, the risk of an asset can be measured by its variance which is found by subtracting uh, the worst outcome from the best outcome you know that's false uh, subtracting the worst outcome from the best outcome gives us the range not the variance so the answer is false coefficient of variation is a measure of relative dispersion used in comparing the risk of assets with differing uh, expected return yes that's true this is the definition of the coefficient of variation okay okay we reached the end of our uh, final revision uh, thank you all for listening and hope you read the best in the exam inshallah and see you next semester